But our text is all about, all about, uh, all about light. So if you have your Bibles, and if you don't, don't feel bad. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm just trying to, you know, make you bring the Bible, right? In, at least when we're dealing with the Ephesians passage. So Ephesians uh, chapter 5. In verse number, we pick it up. We've, we've come through, if you're new with us, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. Uh, verse number six, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So what do you do? Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that's good and right and true. And try not to, or excuse me, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. But when it, anything's exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will do what? Shine on you. Christ will shine on you. And so, I mean, this is a huge, huge text and a huge truth that many Christians, maybe you know very, either very little about or you do very little about. I'll take you back. He was uh, just about 11 years old, and he was so excited, you know, because not a lot happened around, but, but when the, the, the high festivals came up, it was just awesome, you know, and his, his favorite one was the, the Feast of the Tabernacles, and, because, and, and, and not just the Feast of the Tabernacle, but there was something that happened at the last night. It was the illumination the illumination, uh, and he just loved it because, you know, it, it was a multi-sensory experience. And, and, and for his 11-year-old heart, man, he was just all into that. I mean, that's just how he was wired. And so he waited. He went through the, you know, the feast, the different feast days and the different holy things that they had to do. But that night, he just, he got there to the courtyard early before dusk. And there were those huge menorahs, those, those candles that were as high as the city gates and the city walls. And, and he knew that they were going to be lit and Sure enough, they put the ladders up there. They had huge bowls at the top that held 20 gallons of oil and, and a huge wick in there. And, and bam, right at dusk, they lit those things off. And then the light exploded up. You could smell it. You could almost feel the heat from it. And, and it just mirrored off of the temple uh, face, it, that whole courtyard. And it, wherever you were at in Jerusalem, you could see it. From the hillside, you could see it was amazing. And that not only that was going on, but the Levites were down there, and they had their musical instruments, and they were all just getting into it, and they were playing loud, and they were praising God, and different people were running around, and different young priests with torches and lanterns running around, almost in a frenzy, just worshiping God. And this 11-year man, he's just like, man, this is so awesome. And he stayed until it, it ended, and, the, and the, the lamps burned out, and he went home. And the next day he was back there. And they, you know, weren't burning the lights anymore. But you could smell, you could still smell the char off of those huge wicks as it was just that, you know, he was just remembering what it was the night before. And there was a buzz. There was a bunch of people up there on, on the colonnade. And here he was, that preacher, that itinerant preacher that everybody was discussing and arguing about and arguing over. And some people said, man, he's a prophet of God. And others said, he's a, he's a heretic. Man, he's a heretic. And he was speaking, so he moved as, as close as he could. And here this man is speaking. And this man says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And he knew, he knew because he'd been trained, you know, as, as a young Jew. He knew that that, that pillar of fire, the, 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 the celebration, those huge menorahs, was not just something to have a cool time, but that was to symbolize the, the, the Shekinah glory of God, the pillar of fire that, that, that stood between the, the Jews and the Egyptians at the Red Sea. That was that pillar of fire that led them and, and warmed them at night, and, and that was just the representation of God. And so what this, this preacher was saying, what this teacher was saying was the pillar of fire that came between you and the Egyptians, your forefathers, and the Egyptians, the cloud that guided you day and night in the wilderness and illuminated the night, enveloped the tabernacle, the glorious cloud that, that filled Solomon's temple, that's me. I'm the light of the world. And there was a shock that went through that audience because they understood what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, I am God and I'm the light of the world. To put it in a neat nutshell, Paul is saying to me today and you today, hey, I'm the light of the world. And by the way, if you're my child, you are light. Don't hide your light. And a lot of us are. A lot of us are. In verse number eight, it says, for you, and for at one time you were 
darkness. It doesn't say you were in darkness. It says you were darkness. And now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. There's a commentator. I, I respect him, but I think he's wrong here. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a handy illustration. He says, well, really, it's like God is the sun, you know. That, that's, the, he, that's where the, the light emanates from. That's the source of light. And the moon doesn't have a source of light. It just reflects light. And so the, the, the church... And the people of God, we're not the sun, we just reflect, you know, and sometimes we don't reflect it very much, you know, there's just a, a little thumbnail of, of light there, and sometimes, man, we're reflecting big time, but there's always light being reflected. But he doesn't say we're reflecting light here, he says you were darkness and now you are light. We are light. We have the Holy Spirit in us, the glory of God in us. And so he says, I want you to personalize this thing. You're not God, but you are light. And Paul loves analogies and metaphors as, as he lays down God's truth. And so he takes Jesus' word picture of saying, I am the light of the world, and he springboards off of that and to, to the people of God and to us today. He says, hey, I, I want you to understand uh, that, that God expects you to be light. God expects you to walk in the light. God expects you to expose evil with your light. And so we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of this. Some of you aren't going to like it, but... I guess that's with most of God's word, right? If, if I'm shining and not hiding God's light, first of all, I'll know exactly where to walk. I'll know. What do you mean? It says in verse 10, try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. Try to figure out what God wants you to do. God's specific will for my life. And many of us are stymied by, you know, God's will. We can't see it. You're like, John, I can't see. I can't see God's will. I mean, it, it, and it, you know, you say it's supposed to be close to me. I can't see it. And we're like the guy who's on the way, you know, the, the bathroom scale, and then his wife goes by and sees they've been married for a while, so she's kind of, you know, sarcastic, and she looks at him. He's sucking his gut in on the scale, and she's like, Psh. dummy thinks that he's going to weigh less by sucking his gut in, and she says, that's not going to help, and he says, sure it does. It's the only way I can see the numbers. <laughs> so, and some of us, the, the will of God is so close to us, but we can't see it. We cannot see it at all. So you're like, John, how can I know? I want to know God's will for my life. How can I know? Write this down somewhere. Write this down somewhere. Be here next week. Because <laughs> the text goes on, and it's all about God's will and discerning God's will. So I'm not going to steal that thunder with, with this, all right? And, and we're going to go into it. And I can show you how you can narrow down into, so that you will know as, as best as lies within you that you are in the will of God for whatever decision you got making. But here you can write something else seriously down. God's will is revealed by God's light. What, what does that mean, John? It sounds all preachery. Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a what? A light to my path. And so that's why, that's another reason why you ought to be tracking, reading the Bible, whether you read it with us at Point Harbor uh, this year or you're reading a different thing by yourself, but, but you, you're getting light. You're exposing your life, your mind, your volition, your will to the light of God. And so if I'm shining God's light, I'll know exactly where to walk, right? But also if I'm shining God's light, and this is where it gets a little dicey, I'll know exactly who to avoid. <laughs> and it, 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 as I said earlier, we live out in the boonies. And, and some years ago when the kids were all home, I was, uh, I was there with uh, my youngest daughter watching TV. Robinette, my wife, and Johnny were shopping at Walmart in Franklin. And so they're out there, we're watching TV, and all of a sudden I heard it, I heard it. And it was like, ah! And the door, and I knew what it was. I knew that scream. That was not, there's an axe murderer scream. That was, a, I just stepped on a snake scream. And that's what she had done. She'd come out, we didn't have a light outside. She comes out and just, bam! And the thing just, and she screamed, and then she grabbed the door. And then I, so I came, you know, I hear the scream, I'm running to the door, and she opened the door. She comes through and grabs me. She grabs me, and she goes, ah! I'm like, I'm like, and she goes, Nick! and I'm like, okay, I get it. I don't know what Johnny was doing. <laughs> he was out there with her, just backing off. Why did she step on that thing? Did she want to? Did she go, I think I'll step on that snake? Hmm? Couldn't see it. Why not? Yeah, she did not have a tactical flashlight. <laughs> Seriously, I bought her one. She got one just like this. Yeah, so now everywhere she goes, she's got a flashlight, right? I guarantee you, after that, from our house, anywhere, if there's darkness out here in the parking lot, she's like, all right, you know, uh, and she's checking things out. Uh, so you're like, I got my cell phone. Oh, those are wimpy. Grow up and get a real flashlight. 
<laughs> so, but if I'm shining God's light, I'll know where to walk is the point. And, and I'll know who to avoid as well. You're like, who to avoid? What do you mean? Verse, verse, 11, or verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Now, the first little point I want to bring out here is it's kind of a no-brainer. There are some folks from my old life that I ought to avoid, right? Folks I used to run with, get in trouble with, etc. He says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. You're like, but I thought we were supposed to try to reach them. And, and yeah, if, if you're inviting them to church, yeah, bring them here, or, you know, and inviting them to your house to talk about uh, 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 spiritual things, if that's your objective. I'm talking about hanging with them in the same places you used to hang with them and get in trouble. All right? Just chilling with them. Why? Because your light is going to be extinguished. Your battery is going to get weak, and God knows that. And before you know it, you're going to be in a dark, dark place again. You're like, well, John, that's not me. I can hang around with people and not be influenced by them. Well, but you know more than God, because God says in Proverbs, look at this, Proverbs 13, become wise by walking with stupid people. So it says, become wise by walking with the uh, wise and hang out with fools and watch your life fall to pieces. So by extension, if I, I uh, hang out with gossips, guess what I'm going to turn into? A gossip, I hang out with drug dealers, guess what I'm going to be doing? I mean, this is how I got in trouble. Now, I'm not to blame it on my buddies that I, <laughs> from high school, but, you know, I was in this kind of nerdy farm boy group that didn't get in much trouble, but nobody was interested in, and, you know, and we were not cool, and I got kind of an invitation via a fight, but anyway, it's a long story, uh, an invitation to join a cooler group with, you, you know, cooler people. And so, but they were also more evil people. So what did I do? I said, sure, sign me up. And so then I started, that's, I started, I, I went from being, you know, a good kid to, you know, somebody who was drinking, smoking, cussing, all these other things. And it was because I was hanging around people who were drinking, smoking, all, the, all these things. So God's word is true, people. And I've been in ministry over 30 years, and I've seen this fulfilled over and over and over again. You're like, hey, Fred, you know, man, why are you hanging out with them still? Oh, they won't influence me. Right. And then I get a phone call, you know, at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, preacher, you were right. Can you give me bail money? I've had those calls. Or a call one time, a guy said, hey, we need to talk to you. My wife and I, I've done something really stupid. My wife and I went to their house. He, she happened, his wife happened to be a, a deacon's daughter in our church, our small church in Michigan, and went up there and come in. What's up? What's the problem? This guy, a young guy, you know, a, a sharp guy, he would go out. He was a traveling salesman, and so he started doing what other traveling salesmen did, and he brought home an STD and gave it to his wife. She was not pleased with that, and then she divorced his buns. So and we tried to save that marriage, and it wasn't, they, they, she wasn't buying it. So, you hang around with stupid people, you're going to be stupid. 1 Corinthians 15, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. <laughs> it says, don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. It does. Bad company corrupts. That's why you, if you have kids, you ought to, you ought to be care, you know, caring who they hang around with. Because they're going to, if there's this idiot child, you know, and hopefully not in this church, but, and your kid is hanging with an idiot, guess what? Your kid's going to turn into an idiot. Well, I want little Billy to just bring him to Jesus. Well, then have little Billy invite him to church, but don't let little Billy do a sleepover. Some of you, I love you, but you need to get a clue and you need to understand. Bad company corrupts good character. It just does. So there's some folks from your old life that you ought to avoid. Sure, invite them to church, but don't be going back to the same places, doing the same thing, or hanging with them because you're going to end up back where you were. But, surprise, surprise, there are some people in your new life that you should avoid too. What do you mean? What do you mean? But a parallel passage or a complementary passage in Romans, Romans 16. Paul's winding up this book or this letter to the Romans, and he says, hey, I make one more appeal. My dear brothers and sisters, watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not, and these are people who are religious. These are people he's talking about in the church. Stay away from them. Some such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They're serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. These are the so-called believers that you should avoid. And you're like, well, John, I thought that we were supposed to, you know, be all kumbaya and, you know, my brothers and my sisters. And yeah, God says that in the, in, the, in the idealistic, yes, that's what we want. We want unity. But there are some folks who you cannot be unified with, maybe even at your church. 
well, who, who, John, you know, do you have a list? <laughs> no. no, and I'm not thinking of anybody right now. I could, probably could if I start, but I'm not going to. But he breaks down this Romans passage, you know, avoid, avoid people who cause divisions first. Verse 17, watch out for people who cause divisions. These are your so-called Christian uh, gossips. They wouldn't call themselves gossip. They're just saying, well, I'm just sharing, right? But they learned a technique, and they got it straight from Satan. And maybe this is you. Maybe this is you. And just gut check yourself, you know? Because if this is you, you don't come usually, you don't come out and just do a flat-out accusation, Right? You, you couch division in an innocent question. And you might not even know that you're, you're replicating Satan in this. Maybe you ladies can do it like this. You come to your other girlfriend, and, and you go, what do you think about her new, her new hairstyle? Hmm? Hmm? So you, you, you want to say, that's the ugliest hairstyle I've ever seen in my life. What was she thinking of? She got a, somebody with a weed whacker? What's up with that? And you want to gossip about her, but you want to couch it innocently. So what do you, what do you think about that? Because <laughs> you know what your girlfriend's going to say. Girl, she's ugly. <laughs> and you want to hear it. Or how about this? Do you, do, you, do you really think he's qualified to be a deacon? I mean, come on, man. I don't even know he's qualified. Or, or, or this one. How come Brian doesn't teach our kids this subject? Now, what does the Word of God say to do? If you're wondering why Brian doesn't teach a certain subject, ask Brian! <laughs> just duh but you don't want to ask brian you want to create division you want to kind of talk him down maybe or, or pastor mark why well, doesn't pastor mark play the the music that i like what's well, some of this music that he's playing i don't even know man it's not on k love <laughs> so what should you do ask pastor mark and he might not play your favorite song there's a, me, just this is free okay this is free there's you folks are hard to do music for. Why? Because you're so diverse, right? You got you, you, you folks, you know, you have the African-American experience and stuff. So you're more used to the, you know, the soulish type, type stuff and the gospel. And then you got you, you white folks and you got your white folk stuff, you know. And then you Hispanics, you know, you got whatever's going on and the, the, all the rest of you in the middle. It is hard. <laughs> So what do we do? We just said, all right, Lord, what, you know, what, are the, what is the, the music that is really, and, 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 let me just throw this in. This is, the first crowd didn't get this. This is just you. We also try to not play all old music. I mean, you know, music my generation, because we want to reach the next generation. All right? So we're trying to, you know, be relevant and, and, and with all that. And so, it, but it's hard. All right? We might not play your music, but uh, it ain't about you. <laughs> I just... I'll throw that in there. <laughs> so if you, you know, you, I, we had years ago, years ago, we had some folks that came from another church. They came kind of en masse because their church blew up. They came here, and they had a group that met at their house, and then I found out they were saying, and one of them actually told one of our pastors, yeah, we're, we're, we've got some, we're going to change the way Pastor Mark does music. I'm like, no, no, you're not. And then when they couldn't, they all left. So they went as a little group from this church, and they came here, and they're like, oh, we don't get our way, and now they're somewhere else. So see ya. All right, don't, don't, don't learn your techniques from Satan. If you're reading through the Bible with us, you read just a few days ago this passage, Genesis 3. The serpent was the craftiest of all the creatures the Lord God had made. So the serpent came to the woman. Really? Really? None of the fruit of the garden? God says you mustn't eat any of it? Hmm? Hmm? He didn't just say, God's a dirty liar. No, he said, God's a liar later on, but he started out with this real innocent type thing, like some of you do. And God says, be, be on the lookout for folks that do that, that innocent, you know, just kind of dangling something there, a divisive comment. Avoid them. Don't hang around with them. Don't go over to their house and chill with them. Don't watch the Super Bowl with them. I just found out the Patriots aren't going to be there. <laughs> I... <laughs> It's really sad that you cheer that more than you cheer Jesus. That was just a test. Most of you failed. <laughs> Don't go shopping with them. If they're in the same church as you, be kind to them. But the, what does the Bible say? Avoid them. Avoid them. What does that mean, John? That means if you see, you know... Uh, I don't want to use any names because then you'll think I'm talking about somebody, but so, you know, this 
Gertrude the gossip coming towards you? Be nice, you know, but don't hang with her. Why does anybody, anybody want to hang with me? Because you're a gossip, and they're obeying Scripture. I know that sounds rough, but most Christians, here's what, this is, this is more free. <laughs> you are nicer than Jesus. Some of you are nicer than Jesus. Jesus lays out some hard stuff, but many of us, we're like, oh, no, no. We had a guy in the church I pastored in Michigan. He was there when I got there. He was the reason the last pastor left. And he was, he was an expert at this. He was a full, bona fide, biblical wolf. What is a biblical wolf? They're the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? They usually don't come in as a wolf. They come in clothed like a sheep. He came in, man. He knew the Bible. He said, I'll teach this class. He's a little country church of 60 people. So this guy wanted to do everything, and they let him, stupidly. And so then he started, you know, getting power. And then, you know, power in a church of 60, but he wanted it. And then he started spreading rumors about that pastor. They had a, the, the, the church van that needed body work, and so he just, he didn't say, I think that pastor stole that money. He didn't need to. All he said was, it can't have cost that much. I know how much it costs. I'm, I wonder what that's all about. He didn't go to the pastor. He spread it amongst the congregation and got some of those people believing him. And after I came in and we dealt with him, and it took two years to, to nail that thing down, and actually he, he, we had to put him out of the church biblically, then um, I found the receipt, and sure enough, that pastor had and the church had paid that amount of money for that body work. But this guy, he was a divider. Avoid people who cause divisions. And then he says, further, avoid people who promote heresy. What is heresy? Heresy is taking what the Word of God says and flipping it upside down. It's editing the Word of God. Some people do it, who are so-called Christians. In Romans 16, he said, hey, watch out for people uh, who upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from them. And so, Point Harbor, get this, get this. Not every Christian teacher is a Christian teacher. Not. There are some of you that I could use a name and everybody would know who this is. I'm not going to. You can ask me in the foyer if you want. But this mega star teacher in Christianity, I saw a video of his wife saying the other day that Jesus became divine. That he wasn't always divine, but he, then he, one day he became, he kind of got deity from God the Father. That's heresy. That's heresy. But here's the thing. Some of you, that's one of your favorite teachers. Because you don't have senses exercised enough to understand when somebody's throwing down heresy. It's because, you know, I, I've seen preachers, I've seen preachers, that, uh, and a guy did it on purpose, it was mean of him, but he said something in a meeting with a whole bunch of preachers, amen, that's right, amen, that's right, and then he just threw down this heresy, and they're like, yeah, amen, and he said, heresy, <laughs> you idiots. But we get emotionally involved. I've seen it happen in church. You're know, like, oh, man, so whatever the person says, you're like, yeah, because you're emotionally invested in that, and they might have just said that Jesus isn't God, but they said it really cool. Not every Christian book in a Christian bookstore is Christian. Not every Christian teaching program on the internet or blog or, or TV is, is Christian. How can I know? How can I know? Get to know the truth of God so, so, that, so well that it's easy to, to spot the faults. That's why we say read through. As, you know, John, you know, at, at the end of March, April, am I going to become a real Bible scholar? No, you're not going to. But you're going to know more than you did when you started. And for those of you that already read through, it's a refresher, right? It's a refresher. I, I do it every year. So how do I, how do, I do that? J jump in. Start reading. Well, I, I'm starting late. That doesn't matter. Just jump in where we're at, okay? Read through the Bible with Point Harbor. There's some information out there. And then keep your butts in these seats consistently. And then don't take any preacher's or teacher's word for something, even mine, especially when it sounds new. I've had some of you, you know, question me, like, hey, no, you know, and send emails. I, I owe a few of you some emails uh, back when we'd be talking about election and stuff like that. And, and I'll get to you, I'll get to you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Be a biblical Berean. Now, if you don't know the Word of God, you're like, what's a Berean? Acts 17. There, it's a place, it's a place. There was a church established. And, and in Acts, it says the people at the church in Berea were more open-minded. And open-minded, we would take maybe the wrong way. Doesn't mean you believe everything, but you're, you're, they were listening. They were like, okay. Then the people of Thessalonica, that church in Thessalonica. Because the Bereans listened to the message with great eagerness. They, yeah, man, Paul, lay it down. And every day they studied the scripture to see if what Paul said was really true. So they didn't just go, man, it's the Apostle Paul. Look at he's got Apostle Paul robes. He's got a, he's got a, <clears throat> a PhD on his wall. Right? He's been to seminary. 
There are a lot of seminaries in America that are just hell, hell holes. They don't believe the word of God. They don't believe the deity of Christ. And they teach in a bunch of preachers stuff that is diametrically opposed to the word of God. So going to seminary is, means nothing. Means nothing as far as, oh, well, we've got to listen to this person. They're an expert. And so here's the apostle Paul being questioned. Because Paul was laying down some huge things. He came in and said, hey, there's this, there's this uh, guy and he, he was God and he was virgin born and then he came and, and he lived a perfect sinless life and then, and then he died on the cross and he went to the grave and then he resurrected and, and, and if you trust in him, <laughs> he will save you from your sins. And they're like, whoa, man, whoa, what, whoa. They didn't just go, man, yeah, I'm buying into it. They said, all right, let me, let me check that out. Well, what, you know, show, prove it, prove it. He goes, okay, here, scroll of Isaiah, roll that out. Isaiah 53, look at that. Look at Isaiah 50, over to 51. Look at Psalm 22. Oh, my goodness, bam, 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 it just shows. Wow, prophecy's totally fulfilled in Christ. Wow, I'm, sign me up. I'm on board. But they checked him out. They checked him out. Pastor Tom, our executive pastor of ministries, used to pastor in, in Charlottesville a, a church called Berean Baptist Church. And so they were all about being Bereans, you know, because that's their name. <laughs> and they <laughs> kind of prided it, not in a bad way, but so I came there to preach one time years ago. And I don't know what I said. I don't remember what it was, but it was something that one of their men, one of their core men had never heard before. And so he approached me in the foyer with his Bible. He said, hey, we're Bereans here. And I'm like, oh, here it comes. <laughs> uh, and, and you said something that I don't, I've never seen in Scripture. And I said, okay, what was it? And he told me, and I took his Bible, and I said, ticket, 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 okay, right there, right there it is, right there. He's like, oh, cool, thank you, and walked away happy. I wasn't offended that he did that. I was, I was happy that he did that. Tom had taught them well. So, and I'm not talking about you emailing me every time you slightly disagree with something. Please, don't blow me up like that. Uh, and, and I'm not, you know, so I'm talking about major things, major things. And I'm not talking about you hanging around or not hanging around other people because you disagree with minor matters. That's not what he's talking about here. What do you mean like minor matters, Lord? Well, some of you in here, I love you and I pray for you. You're vegans. And, <laughs> I'm, and you can be, I, I, don't, <laughs> I, I, I have vegans in my family. Actually, it will surprise you, vegans, I went to a holiday vegan party. Now, they didn't call it that, but they might as well have. So I show up and, they, and they, you know, there's a vegan, and my, my, my niece, and she's a sweetheart, but she's total vegan. She's talked her parents into being vegan, so they were there. And so, you know, the family came over for this holiday hoopla thing, we call it, uh, and, and, and it was all vegan. And so I, 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 you know, so I didn't bring a rack of ribs. And that wouldn't have offended them, but it just wouldn't have been nice. Plus, they're Jewish, so that wouldn't have worked out well either. So I, I, so I brought a salad. And then there was these other sprouts and stuff, and there was some of this hummus thing, and so what did you do? I ate, we had a good time, and then I drove through Burger King. <laughs> I, <don't know>. <laughs> I, just, I <laughs> So anyway, he's talking about the core truths here, you know, the fundamentals of the faith that, that, that will divide us and should divide us. Well, like what? Inspiration of Scripture. That, that this is God's Word, and I have no editor rights. Some of you think you have editor rights. You're like, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. Because you take some stuff and you either ignore it or you try to explain it away when it's right there in black and white. You might not like it. There's some stuff in the Bible. I, you know, if it were up to me, I, I'd edit hell out because I have some people I love that went there. And so I'd change that. But what is it? I just don't understand the full righteousness of God that demands it. So I'm not, you know. So I, I have to say by faith, Lord, I, okay, but I, man, you know, I'm not digging that. Virgin birth. Jesus is born of a virgin. The deity of Christ, that he's, he's fully God and yet fully man. How about this one, the sinless life of Christ, that he, we, he never sinned. There is a show on Netflix out there about Jesus, that he was really had homosexual relationships with his, you know, apostles or whoever. I, I don't know. What, but that, what in the world? What did you do, John? I, me? I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not really into leading boycotts at all, but we had Netflix, and so I told Robin, I said, shut that thing down. I don't need to support that. I, good night. You know, we watch too much, and I probably don't watch half the TV that most people do, if that, but, you know, I don't need Netflix. I got Amazon Prime. What happens if they do it? Then I'll shut them down, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you can do what you want, but I thought, you know what? So she, and they had a thing. Uh, uh, why are you uh, canceling? Because uh, we don't want our Savior being portrayed unbiblically 
as a homosexual. That's not a slap on homosexuals. That is a slap on Netflix for getting it wrong. Blood atonement. The second coming of Christ. Core truths. So, someone comes and says, you know, they're questioning whether Jesus really is God. God says, don't hang around them. Now, I, I, I was asked a question by folks. Like, what, what, if, what if they live with you? <laughs> Lady, if your husband, you know, is an atheist, this does not give you permission to go and kick the boy out. All right? That's not what it's saying. It's talking mainly about the church context. But then by extension, you know, your other relationships. But if you're there in your family, don't go out and go, I can't talk to you again, my preacher says. All right? Another, another complimentary passage that some of you need to uh, drill down in. 2 John uh, uh, verse 7 says, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. So this is talking about the dudes that pedal the bicycles up to your house, or the ones that knock on you from the, the Jehovah Witness folks. And I know some of you, I'm hurting you, or I'm, I'm making you mad because you either know someone or someone in your family. Okay, and again, if they're in your family, whatever, I, I'm not saying don't go to family events, but I'm saying that you can't just have a Bible study with them. And if they're not in your family, they're just coming to your door, the Bible says, do not let them in your house. You might not like that, but that's what the Bible says. My mother-in-law lived in, uh, in, in West Norfolk for years, and she's a gracious, gracious, well, she's in heaven now, but she was gracious, you know. But they would come on the bikes, you know, these, these in, in, in August with their little suits on, and, and they would come up to her, you know, knock on her door, and she would say, and they'd say, hey, we're from whatever, you know, we want to do a Bible study. And she'd go, no, my pre her, her excuse was, my preacher won't let me talk to you. <laughs> but then she, so I said, you know, so how'd, how'd that go? She told me about it. She goes, oh, but they were hot and sweaty, so I gave them Coca-Cola. I'm like, I think you violated that passage there. I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> so don't share in their wicked work, all right? So if, if God says, you know, God's a good God. He'd never send anyone to hell. Let's do a Bible study together. Decline the offer is what he's saying. So, and I know this. Some of us, again, you're, you're nicer than Jesus, so you're going to end up wrecking your spiritual life because somebody deceives you. That's his point. Protect yourself and your family. So avoid believers who are divisive gossips, and then avoid believers who try to rewrite God's word. Back to Ephesians 5 and, and verse number 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We, uh, at New Year's Eve, my, my son and, and Aubrey, my daughter-in-law, they, they live down in the Outer Banks. And uh, he said, hey, what you doing for New Year's Eve? I, you know, and, and a lot of times I just sleep the New Year's Eve in. When you're my age, you just sleep it in. It's going to happen, right? You don't need to watch it. But they said, no, come on down, come on down. We're going to have a good time. So we went down there, you know, to their place and, and, uh, in the Outer Banks, and we had a good time. They said, where should we go eat? And last year we went to uh, Captain George's, so we were like, let's do that. You know, they got online, they're open, they got a special. And so buffet. Whew. Mercy. You could commit a lot of sin in Captain George's. <laughs> and I did. I'm sorry. I already repented of it, but... So, you know, because you're paying for a buffet, and it's got all this seafood and all this stuff. And yeah, they have the salad, you know. Like, who goes to eat salad at Captain George's? Certainly not me. So I, I got this stuff, stuff I'm not supposed to eat, you know, but it's, it's New Year's Eve. I know I'm going to blow up. It's going to be bad, but <laughs> Lord Jesus, protect me from my stupid decisions. So I, I went. Did you, did you commit gluttony? Yes, I, but I already told you. I, I got that fixed with Jesus, all right? And so I only had two plates, but, you know, they were, they were, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, this is about 6 o'clock. Yeah. So then about 7.30, I waddle out of there. <laughs> we go back to their place. They're like, well, where should we go for the... I, I, I said, let's just, let's just stay here. Let's stay in. I don't want to go anywhere. No, no, don't be a party pooper. So then they went and Googled some more stuff. And, hey, they have... They, my wife, my wife, they got karaoke down at the Jolly Roger. I'm like, who have I married? What karaoke? What? <laughs> karaoke. I'm like, you go. You will do karaoke if we go to the Jolly Roger. 
Well, yeah. And you don't know, my wife, she won't sing with us anymore. She won't sing. She won't sing on Christmas Eve for Jesus. She, you know, in front of you folks, she won't do that. She used to be a lead singer in a rock band back in the 70s in this area. And so, but now she says, no, I don't have any more. So now this girl wants to do karaoke at the Jolly Roger. So I'm like, okay, I, you know, I guess I have to experience this. So we go, and I'm feeling, uh, and then we go in, and we sit at the, the Jolly Roger. There's nobody in the restaurant section. Then over here, you got another restaurant section and the bar section, totally slammed. So we get there about, I don't know, by that time, it was like 10 o'clock. We get there 10 o'clock, 10.30, totally slammed. People just standing, but we found one booth, boop, at the back. So yeah, okay, all right, we're here. And then we ordered appetizers, which none of us needed. So we're there. <laughs> And they're up there doing karaoke, horrible karaoke. And, you know, it gets closer to midnight, closer to midnight. People are very friendly. <laughs> People can't talk very well. My wife says, oh, you know, and then the ball drops. Oh, and we're wearing stupid hats and we kiss. And then she says, like, I still want to do karaoke. I'm like, all right, let me go check. So I go around there up to the front where it's totally packed. It's like a mosh pit, you know. And, and so I come up there. <laughs> There are people doing things they should not do on the dance floor. They're mimicking, you know what I would call dirty dancing or twerking or jerking or smirking or something. All of this stuff. <laughs> oh, dear Lord Jesus. Oh. So what did you, what did you do, John? Well, I, I, lit, I lit him up. So, <laughs> look at you. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I wanted to, but I thought, well, that would be a bar fight, and then I'd, I'd be arrested, and then my church would wonder what in the world I was doing at the Jolly Roger. I just wanted to listen to my wife sing <laughs> some 70s rock song. So, no, we just said, it's time to go. So she never did get to sing karaoke. I know, that's sad. So sad. <laughs> so you had a waiting list for two hours and 40 minutes at that point in time, yeah. So I'm like, we go. So... I, I, I'm not to be, so I, no, I didn't go, you wicked pervert. What would your mother think? Right? Because that's what some of you think when you're shining the light. You know, and I'm not, I'm not doing that. That's not how to impact darkness. So when you come home, when you come home in your house, you forgot to, you, you, you come home and it's all dark. What do you do to impact the darkness? You tell me. Turn on the light. Yes. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. You turn on the light. So what, you know, I, I'm not saying don't stand up for the truth. But, but I am saying you, you turn on the light. Well, how do I turn on the light? The Bible says you, you speak the truth in love. That's how you turn on the light. In your different scenarios, wherever you're at, in your family, your workplace, God expects you to be light, salt and light. But many of us don't. We're dim bulbs. We don't, you know. We let culture or whatever scare us. We were scared of being called a hater or whatever. Scenario, him, hey, bro, don't tell anybody, but I'm thinking about starting a little side fling with that hot coworker of mine. You know, she's hot. What do you think? You. Hey, dude, you're married. Him. So what, man? My old lady's cold as ice. You. Doesn't matter. Him. Says who? You. God. <laughs> him. It's none of your business. <laughs> you. I thought you asked me a question. I thought you asked my opinion. You made it my business. You might just, by turning your light on in that scenario, in a loving way, and what's you turning your light on? It's showing them what God says. It's through the lens. It's not your lens. It's God's lens. You're showing them what God says about the truth. God's put you in, in positions all the time, some of you, and, and, and we're failing. Many times we're just dim bulbs. We don't, you know, like a question comes about this or that, and, and we know what we believe, but we don't offend anybody. And it's no wonder culture is just rolling over us like a wave. You're a voice of sanity. You're a voice of light. You're not supposed to be a dim bulb. That goes for any hot cultural topic. Anyone. Like throwaway marriages. Instead of telling your girlfriend, yeah, he was mean to you and he doesn't love you and he doesn't do the dishes, you should probably, you know, you can do better. If, if, if you're both believers or they're both believers, you know what God says? Stay. Work it out. Fight for it. But that's not popular, right? And I'm not trying to beat you up that have had divorces and stuff like that, but some of you, you know it. You, you opted for the easy way out. You didn't fight for it. And so if you would, you would turn the light in, some, some of you are a dim bulb there. Instead, you ought to say, hey, girl, do you believe God's word? Yes, I do. Well, let me, let me show you in 1 Corinthians you know, 7 what it says about that. You might not like it, but here it is. She might not know, and she might go, okay, yeah, I don't like it, but all right, here's what God says. Right? My only option is 
at getting out of there, uh, if, if one of us has a, you know, a, adulterous affair or, or he's not really a believer and he deserts me because of my faith. Homosexuality. A bunch of you are scared of that. A bunch of you, when I mention that, you get all, don't you? Hope they're not taping this. God's real clear about it. Our society's not. Our society's, you know, it's, just, it's, it's whoever you want to love. The Bible says love is a choice. And, and the Bible says that that is a sin. And so it's gonna, I'm not going to go out there preaching and, and, you know, having placards and stuff like that. Or, and, but John, they'll call me a hater. I know they will. It's always kind of irritating when the light's turned on, right? But God says, I want you to expose some things because there's a judgment for that. He, and he's, he's not changed his mind. Well, John, I don't know what you're talking about. Romans chapter 1, read it. It's pretty rough stuff. God says there is a judgment. If you, if you, not that you're tempted by it, okay? But that you engage in it and you engage in it without repentance, God says there is a bridge out. I am going to judge heavily that lifestyle. And some of you that say you love your, and, and I know it's tough if you have a family member that's in that. It's tough for you to be the light, isn't it? You know what's easier? To, to shut the light down and go, whoever you want to love, sweetie, I'm just happy for you. You just hurt him. You just hurt him. You haven't helped him. You think you have. You think you're not being a hater, but you're being a hater. First, you're being a God hater. And then you're hating them because you're letting them go faster and faster toward judgment and even promoting it. Now, a bunch of you don't like that. Some of you won't be back. But that's what God says. And guess what? I ain't in that either. And neither are you. Transgenderism, since I made some of you mad, let's, let's throw more on me. Some of you that, you know, all right, I, I lift weights, right? I've lifted weights twice competitively, all right? Just, it was just, you know, and I was in the old geezer category, and I still didn't win. really sucked. But, <laughs> I, <laughs> so, but if I was, you, you, you ladies, and you're in sports, I would not be pleased right now. Because if, if and I've seen it, there was a guy, and he, 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 you know, couldn't win in the men's division, so he went over and identified as a girl and blew it away. Oh, look at me. I mean, look at me. Dude. You're a dude. They might say, oh, well, we can't. If you're identifying, I don't care, man. That's seriously, it's a mental. They used to call it a mental disorder. Johns Hopkins University, and there's still a guy teaching there, and unless he's changed his mind, said, that is a mental disorder. You thinking, while well, you're a dude, you're a girl, or while well, you're a girl, you're a dude. And I know some of you are like, John, wait, I'm kind of confused about my identity. It's easy to tell. I love you, all right? I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to pile on or hurt you. I'm, t I'm out of love, out of love. The highest suicide rate, people that transition to something they're not and then find out that that doesn't do it for them either. So they're just like, I'm going to end it all. Lovingly speak God's truth. I'm not talking about, again, I'm not talking about getting ob obnoxious, but I'm talking about when the topic comes up, and it will, why don't you turn the light on? Say, hey. Guys, I know it's not politically correct, but, you know, here's what God says. But who cares what God, well, I do, for one. He saved my soul. I'm trusting my entire destiny to, up on this book. And so, yeah, I, I pay attention to it. I do. I hate it when I'm preaching and it says, Siri not available. Stop it. Okay, there it is. Must have said something. Uh, <laughs> One of our guys, I, I, I thought this was so cool. I, I spoke on Thursday night this message, and he put this on Facebook. Robert told me it, and so I said, hey, send, see if I can use it. And he said, I could. James Moretti said, so after hearing this is Thursday night, same message. Tonight's message about being light and sharing what you believe and know is right according to God's word with others who are deceived by the world and Satan. I wanted to share an experience I had at work the other day. I work in the shipyard. We have fire watches with us every day. There happens to be a bunch of downtime in the shipyard. Shocking, I know. So we spend a lot of time talking, which creates a lot of opportunities for sharing my faith. This particular older woman always says things like, blessed to be the best, or too blessed to be too stressed, etc." And so we were talking, and I was reading to her and, and, and trying to figure out where she was in her walk. She knew her Bible, but come to find out, she was in a homosexual relationship and even went to a homosexual-based church. No, James says, I had no idea that such a thing actually existed. <laughs> James needs to get out more. 
She actually thought God was okay with me or with where she was in life and that she was a lesbian. So I had to take the opportunity God put before me. I explained to her that God would never be okay with that. Showed her from Scripture where she was wrong. Showed her from Scripture. Didn't just say, this is my opinion. She resisted, but I counted on the Holy Spirit at this moment. Nothing I said would convince her from where she stood. That didn't matter. God put me there at that exact moment, at that exact place to speak for him. I love that. To speak. Who will speak for God in your workplace if not you? It's now up to God and the Holy Spirit to convince her. She was a super talkative woman, but didn't say much for the rest of the day. <laughs> the Holy Spirit was at work. That part is not up to me. So we need to stay alert and be ready to give an account. Eternal lives and generations depend on us. Why aren't you, some of you, turning on the light in your kids' lives? You say you love them, but there are things that you know, and it's God's truth, and it might be politically incorrect. And so you, you just kind of edit God, or you kind of soft soap it or whatever. And they're being shaped by culture, and they believe some things that might shock you if you ask them. Light will always affect darkness. But, but what does it look like? What does it look like? Verse 8, for at one time you were darkness. Not you were in darkness, but you were darkness. Now you are light. So walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that's good and right and true, the fruit of the light. You know, what is that? It's, I think it parallels the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith. Those things are the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of life. And God has strategically placed you somewhere to turn the light on and shine into somebody. It may irritate them. They might not like it. I'm like, ah, I don't like that. Why? Because it exposes them. It exposes them. It hits their pride. It hits their, you know, their, their lifestyle many times. Again, I'm not talking about being out there and being obnoxious, but I'm talking about in your family. When you have that Thanksgiving thing and that subject comes up and, and you have not said anything because you didn't want to, God says, is it time to turn the light on to your kids? And many times turning the light on is just giving the gospel, right? God has placed you there to turn the light on by giving the gospel to somebody. But it might be to somebody, the, the person impacted might be somebody that you weren't even aiming at. Back in Gary, Indiana, when I was, we were living there, one of the Bible colleges we went to, and living in this little shack of a house. And in order to get out of this area, it's called the Black Oak area of Indiana, or Gary, Indiana, and we had to go past this gentleman's club, most misnamed piece of property in the United States of America, gentleman's club. Nothing gentlemanly goes on in there. And there was some stuff on the outside that kind of told you what it was, even if you didn't know how to read English, which my four-year-old son did not at that point in time, know how to read very much. And so he's like, Mama, what's that? We're driving by. And I don't know how much she told him, but enough to shock his little sensibilities. What? What? So what did they do? Every time they drove by from then on, they prayed. Robin would lead him. Uh, Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, we pray that you will just take this thing out of here. Take this thing out of here. In, in, in Jesus' name, amen. Every time they drove by it, every time they drove by it, they, she did not protest. She did not write letters to the editor. They prayed. One day they drove by, and it was smoldering. It had burnt to the ground. And a little four-year-old boy was like, Ah, oh, look at what Jesus did. Thank you, Jesus. Took that bad place, burned it to the ground. Robin had to hide the gas cans behind our garage. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> as far as I know, that wasn't the case. But something happened and it burned down. Nobody died. Don't worry about that. All right? <laughs> but here's what happened. Little Johnny believed in a big God. And Robin was shining her light in that direction, but she was really shining over here on little Johnny. And little Johnny, to this day, is serving God in ministry. And he could take you that, back to that time. And other times like that. The strip club owner didn't see the light, as far as we know, but my baby boy did. Turn the light on, Point Harbor. Turn the light on in your families. Turn the light on in those discussions that you know are going to get people mad at you, but you just, God put you there to give his truth. Don't be a dim bulb. Don't be a dim bulb. Turn the light on. Lord, we pray that you would help us to do exactly that. Just to lay out your truth lovingly. In mercy, you over and over, mercy and truth, mercy and truth. But God, it's always truth, not just mercy. A lot of us have just been nicer than you. We've been just tons of mercy, no truth. And Lord, I'm sure there are some folks here who are all, all truth and no mercy too. And I pray that you would help them to have the mercy and the love and to turn the light on and shine it and, and, and expose things 
Lord, do that in our lives too. Where I'm living corruptly, where I have secret sins, Lord, do it in me first. And change lives, Lord. Have your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Where are you at in the lighten things up department? Some of you right now, as I was speaking, you, you, you thought of a scenario where you wimped out, right? You should have said something. You didn't. Maybe it was at work. You didn't want to be thought of as a hater, you know? And that's what Satan's tactics is, you know, just to take it to the extreme and say, no, you can't talk because if you don't agree with us, you're a hater. No, 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 I'm not a hater. I'm a lover. I'm a lover of truth. I'm a lover of you being connected to God. And so I got a right to talk. And since you brought the subject up, some of you in your family, some of you it's a neighbor, maybe it's a church member, right? Maybe it's a relationship you're in and you realize through your Bible reading that, wow, you know, y'all ought not be doing that. And you know that he'll be upset or she'll be upset. Turn the light on. Just show them what God says. Who you need to talk to. God, I pray that you will help us to be bold, but loving light sh bearers. And God, use us in an amazing way. Sometimes not at the people we're even targeting. Sometimes, Lord, you have something totally different in mind. But you're God. So, Lord, help us to obey you and never edit you. And all God's kids said, amen.